Hello again. It's David here with um, part two of my talk on anxiety and panic attacks. Welcome back to my pokey little studio, such as it is. Um, <clears throat> on my last recording, I talked about um, panic, anxiety, and about sensitization and hyperventilation, over breathing and the role that they both play. Now, I want to tell you the rest of my story from when I was 18, because that will give you some insight into how you managed to get yourself into the state you're currently in, <coughs> and more importantly, how you can actually get yourself out of it. Now, curing, or the word cure, is not something that well, certainly the medical profession like to use when it comes to talking about anxiety and panic attacks. They talk about controlling it or you learning to live with it as if it's a permanent affliction, a permanent disability, and you've got it and now you're stuck with it. Well, that is just plain wrong. It can be cured. I know a lot of people have been cured. <clears throat> and have gone on to live full and happy lives after having suffered some of the worst anxiety and panic ever. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll pick up from where I was when I left my story from the last time. <clears throat> I've just returned home after my failed attempt to return to work. And all the bottled up tension and emotion that I felt came pouring out of me and I cried and cried and, uh, and I thought well when I calmed down and sort of got you know, some semblance of normality back I realized that um, I would have obviously to go back to the doctor again because I was off work <coughs> and I needed a certificate apart from anything else so the following week I got an appointment and I went to see him, and again, I explained in detail, as much as he would let me, what had happened to me. And again, I asked him to try and explain to me what it was you know, that was happening to me. Now, he, he obviously had an inkling, at least. I mean, this was 1972. You've got to remember that this subject was not one that was much talked about or much known about in terms of the medical profession certainly and certainly there wasn't much in the way of treatment around <clears throat> but he once he tweaked finally that I was talking about anxiety one form or another he started saying stupid things like oh well you'll just have to learn to live with it you'll have to learn to pull yourself together and all this rubbish I thought, well, thanks, mate. That's not really what I want to hear. I was just hoping he was going to help me understand it by explaining it to me, which he wouldn't. But I persisted. I, sort of, I told him I cannot go to work feeling like this. And I just kept on and on because I was desperate by that stage. I just had to know what to do. So he kind of peered at me. And, this, and then he went across to his desk and started writing something. And there was a sort of pain silence for a minute or two. And then he handed me a slip, which was a certificate, and, and a certificate, I should say. Uh, a slip, a slip, he said, well, this is to refer you to a psychiatrist. You'll probably have to wait about six weeks at least, perhaps two months. And I thought, a psychiatrist? I thought, Wow, <laughs> things must be serious if he's doing that. Um, at the time, it's, it was quite a shock you know, to be told that you needed a psychiatrist. That basically was the only option. You know, if you saw a GP with this sort of thing, they referred you on to a, psych a psychiatrist. But anyway, um, I was shocked. Yes, of course, I was shocked. He gave me a certificate for six weeks. I thought, well, at least it means I don't have to try and force myself to go back to work for six weeks. So I 
you know, there's no other word of explanation from it, no helpful advice, no reassurance of any kind. In fact, he just seemed as if I was there wasting his time. That's how it felt to me. He, he, you know, just, he didn't say anything, but it, it was the feeling that I'm there when there are more important people to see. I shouldn't boy, be wasting my time on somebody like you, and that's exactly how it felt to me. But I left, and I, I um, you know, went back home and, and started to think of the implications of what had just happened. And like I said, obviously, I thought, well, psychiatrist, that must be something serious. And of course, it started to bring about all these fears, what if, what if, what if, I'm sure you know all about the what ifs. What if I'm going mad? What if I've got some serious mental illness? And, uh, I mean, it didn't stop there. So I thought, well, this doctor has not told me a damn thing. I don't know any more than, I, than when I started. So I thought, well, if he won't tell me, I'll just have to try and find out for myself. Because I, I'm the sort of person I need to understand things, and especially something like this. So I went to a local library and I started getting all these weird and wonderful books. I got books by Sigmund Freud, I got books on physiology and about or anything I thought might give me an answer. Because I mean this was long before the internet when there was no other way to, place to go. There was the only place to go was your library. So I um, I got all these books, so I took them back home and I'm in in the next few weeks, I started, I had, you know, this was the only thing I did. I just kept playing through these books, trying to find answers. Now, going back to this sensitization issue, it doesn't just affect you in the physical sense, it also affects your mental processes, in that your mind is on alert all the time. You're looking to find out what is wrong and what was making you afraid. So your mind goes around in circles, trying one th explanation after another to try and understand this state of fear that you're in. You know, and that's all part of the process. That's what you would do in a real threatening fear situation. You, your mind will work at high speed, trying to decide the best thing to do. So, but it also makes you very suggestible. When you're sensitized, you're very suggestible to what you read what you hear. So I started reading all this stuff and about you know, psychosis and neurosis and you know, all this stuff. And I mean, any other time I could have read it quite dispassionately, but at that time, the more I read, the more upset I became. And I still wasn't finding any answers. I still didn't know what on earth was the matter with me. And I read books on you know, human anatomy and physiology, I try to think, well, there's got to be something in here which explains what I've just, you know, what, ex what I experienced and what I've felt like since, but I couldn't find anything. So, in my suggestible frame of mind, with all the what ifs, I started to make things up in my own imagination. Perhaps it's that, maybe it's this, maybe it's something. And I, over the next few weeks, as I, the more of this stuff I, I poured over, the more frightened I became. <clears throat> and you know, I wasn't getting any better, I was getting worse. I was, I was feeling more and more anxious. I was just picking at my food. I couldn't, I felt so restless and anxious. I couldn't concentrate still on anything. I couldn't, the only thing I could concentrate was on these wretched books which were doing me no good whatsoever. <clears throat> still, things progressed in that fashion for several more weeks and by the time we got to mid-April, um, something happened in mid-April that changed everything. I was sat one afternoon reading one of these books, I think it was a book on yoga actually, I tried everything to find answers, and as I sat I noticed, suddenly noticed that my breathing was a bit odd, I was breathing very very shallowly and it felt like I was forcing myself to breathe. Not that it was I was breathing naturally, I felt like I was I can't describe it, it's just like 
it was an effort to breathe in a way. And of course, with my frightened state of mind, that kind of set off alarm bells, and I thought, oh God, now what's happening? I tried to sort of rationalize it and think, well, don't be silly, there's nothing wrong with your breathing, you're just breathing like you always do. But of course, in that frame of mind, it didn't go away. I dwelt on it, I brooded on it. So by the time I came to go to bed that night, I was in quite a state of uh, apprehension, thinking, you know, something's wrong with my breathing, something's going to happen to me because my breathing's not right, and you know, all this kind of stuff. So when I was in bed, as soon as I lay down, I noticed that the same feeling was there. I felt like my breathing was not working properly, and like I, it seemed to me that unless I consciously breathed in and out, and this is physiologically impossible, but it felt to me in my frightened state that my breathing would actually stop if I didn't actually think about it. That's exactly how it seemed. I mean, it's a stupid, ridiculous idea, but that's how I felt at the time. So I panicked. I started breathing faster and faster and faster, and my hands and my fingers were going numb. In fact, I even had what's it called, a titanic claw or something. Your, your wrists kind of flex involuntarily. They kind of, the muscles sort of flex like that. I even had that because I was hyperventilating so badly. And I got my mum and dad out of bed and they took me through and tried to calm me down. They made me a cup of tea and, um, I mean, they, my own mother had, had anxiety in her early years, so she did at least know something about anxiety, and she she tried very hard to reassure me through it all. I mean, I I, I was very grateful that she at least had a, something of an understanding of it, but it didn't help me at all because I couldn't I couldn't be reassured at that time because I was just too scared, you know, too scared to accept the reassurances. But at least you know she did do that for me, which did help. Her. Considerable man, but again she tried to do the same thing, and uh, I was just by that stage I was just so far gone. I was just so exhausted mentally and physically and emotionally. I just I just carried on in this, you know, breathing like this, and I stayed up the whole night. I eventually went to bed, and my dad stayed up with me and stepped in the chair for a bit, and I just. It just kept getting waves and waves of panic. It kept coming and coming and coming. And I got tired and more exhausted. And as the night wore on, I just really feel the fight was going out of me. I just felt I began to think there's no hope for me now. And I got it fixed in my mind that if I stopped thinking about breathing, that I would stop breathing. I couldn't get this idea out of my head. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? I can't stay awake indefinitely. And I just got more and more upset. And uh, by about 7 o'clock, my dad woke up and he had to go to work. So I thought, well, what am I going to do now? I don't want to go to bed because I know what could happen. So I went outside. And I, for the next two hours, I just wandered around in the garden, just sort of ran in circles a kind of dazed, numb state. I felt like I was waiting to be executed. And I was just waiting to be, you know, somebody was going to kill me. And I just felt kind of resigned, resigned to the fact that as soon as I went to sleep, I was going to die. That's what it seemed like to my thinking. So I just kept wandering around. I was just numb. I was just, didn't feel anything by that stage. I just felt drained and numb and just totally wiped out. Well, I couldn't do anymore. I thought I'd done everything I could think of to try and find an answer and cure myself and get over this, but nothing has worked. Nothing. And now I'm condemned to death because my breathing's going to stop. Stupid idea, but that's exactly what I thought. About nine o'clock, 
her mother goes out and uh, she looks at the window and she can see and she looked very worried. <clears throat> so she said, well, please come back in and we'll have a talk. And uh, so I sort of stumbled indoors, slumped into a chair. And she talked again like she tried to so many times to reassure me. And I just, I was too tired to take in anything. I just thought, well, I, I resigned myself to my fate. I thought, well, I've, I've got to sleep, so that's it. Let's do it, let's get it over with. So I excused myself, went off and crawled into bed, lay down. I thought, right, this is it. This is really it. This is the end of me. I'm gonna close my eyes and I'm gonna fall asleep and that'll be that. I kind of said sort of, sort of mental goodbyes. It was, uh, it was, it, it was real. It felt real to me that I really wasn't going to make it. And that was that. I just was completely resigned. Anyway, I slept for two hours. I didn't have any dreams. I don't remember a thing. I just, but I woke up quite suddenly after two hours. And as I came to, the first thing I noticed was that my breathing was working fine. It was normal. I was just slowly breathing in and out. There was nothing wrong with it at all. And I mean, apart from the fact that I was amazed to actually still be there. You know, when I opened my eyes and realized I was still here, still alive, and that my breathing was actually working perfectly fine. And I had this extraordinary sense of peace. There was no fear left. I felt no fear at all, nothing. All the feelings I'd been so used to for so many weeks, it just vanished. And I sat up in bed and I looked around the room and it was a nice bright sunny morning. And I looked across and around at things and I looked across at my bookcase of all the books on and I suddenly started thinking about books I'd like to read and how interesting they would be and sort of weird, I mean, what a weird thing to think at that time, but that's, I actually felt some interest again. And with all this came this remarkable feeling that I'd never had before. It was a feeling of like I, I knew that everything was going to be all right. It was like somebody or something was saying to me, you're going to be all right. It was such a sure, a certain feeling inside of me that nothing was going to hurt me. I wasn't going to die through lack of breathing or anything else. I was going to get over this. And to this day, I still don't really understand what happened, but it was a very, very powerful experience. I mean, it was every bit as powerful as what I felt like when I panicked the first time. And from that point on, I started to recover. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't immediately cured at that stage. It took me weeks and, well, weeks and months to really get over the feeling, feelings of fear themselves. You know, to recover my, from my nervous system, to recover, recover from its sensitization. But that one moment, stayed in my mind, it was such a powerful thing to keep in my mind and it gave me for the first time hope. I didn't really have you know, an explanation as to how I was going to get better, I just knew I was going to get better. And weeks that followed were just, well I had some amazing times and some did some things I'd never done before. I had some happy, some of the happiest times of my whole life once I started the cycle of recovery. And, but that one morning, that one priceless moment when I came to, and like I said, I've never had anything before or since like that. It was just, I don't know, inexplicable, but it was incredible. And what, in fact, what I worked out subsequently years later was that um, I'd actually 
accidentally discovered the cure you know, by myself. What had happened was, where I'd been through that awful long night, and it truly was a dark night of the soul in the real sense of the expression, once I'd been through that long night, I reached a point of total submission. You know, I just gave up the fight. I couldn't do any more. I did literally feel like I was somebody waiting to be executed, and there was nothing more I could do. Nothing. And in that attitude, that attitude of total and utter surrender to how I was and how the situation was, it was that that was the key to me recovering. I had given up the fight and I'd stopped all this constant pressure on my own body, my own nervous system. All the worrying, all the tension, all the fear. I'd stopped doing that and in that one moment my nervous system just sort of kind of said, that's it, I don't need to be on alert anymore. And that's exactly how it it operated, it shut down all this excessive, exaggerated stuff. So I was to learn after that 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 is in fact you know, the way to get better, but I just stumbled upon it quite by accident because of the circumstances that I found myself in. And so that was, uh, that was amazing. And, uh, it wasn't until a couple of months after that, that I finally came upon a book which changed my life. And I mentioned briefly Claire Weeks, Dr. Claire Weeks, and it was her book that I found. And I, I was vaguely aware of her because my mum knew about her. She'd seen her on television. She knew that she treated people with anxiety, but she didn't know any more than that. And I knew that she'd written a book. and. Again, it was a weird experience because I'd, on the day in question when I got the book, I'd been actually been at the hospital because though my breathing problems had to kind of, um, you know, I still did occasionally have difficulty breathing, but it wasn't like it was because I wasn't terrified of it. It was upsetting, but it wasn't terrifying like it had been. And uh, so I kept moaning to the doctor about about this and he'd referred me on to have a chest x-ray X -ray just to you know, put my mind at rest. So I'd been to the hospital to do that and I left the hospital and I was coming back into the shop, shopping area in, in the town where I was and I went into a bookshop and just sort of had a look around, wasn't looking for anything specific. <clears throat> and then I saw this book on the shelf, top of the shelf, and it was called Self Help for Your Nerves. And I thought, ah, I've heard of that. This is what my mum had told me. So I thought, well, I've got to read that because it was Claire Weeks' book. So I bought it and I started to flick through it. And I, I could see immediately, you know, this was something that, that was going to help me. So I took my book and I thought, well, I'll go catch a bus home. It was quite a long bus journey I had to take to get, it was a kind of a country route so it was going to take a while. But it was a nice sunny June day and I thought well I'll sit on the bus and I'll read my book. And the bus got underway and I started to read this book and I thought this book is written about me. She wrote this book about me because everything she said is exactly what I'd experienced. She explained everything, she described everything. And when, once I realized that here at last was the explanation that I'd been looking for for so long, I just looked up from my book and I looked around and everything suddenly shone. The colors were all intense and very, very bright. And I just felt this overwhelming feeling of just relief and joy. Suddenly, I found a solution. I found an explanation, and it was one of the happiest moments I'd ever had in my whole life. And I just, when I got to the end of the bus journey, I just jumped off the bus, and I was like, I was floating down the road, just sheer relief. It's just every time I recount that story, 
you know, it, <laughs> it was just such a wonderful, wonderful experience because I found answers after so long of asking questions and not getting any answers. And there was this wonderful book. Um, that book is, like I could say, it was, it saved my life because even though I was on the way to getting better, I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really understand what had happened and why. So Claire Weeks explained everything in great detail in this wonderful book. I've still got my copy, it's still around right here somewhere. It's very old and it's very battered, but uh, I've still got it. 42 years old it is. <laughs> I just, it's like my lucky charm. I don't, I don't, I could have got plenty of new copies of it, but I just love this old book because it, it's special, a special thing that I'm going to keep forever. Now, like I said, that, um, things changed completely that year for me. I I was only 18 and I was just a boy really, but in those months that I recovered, I actually sort of grew up. I grew up from being a boy and it changed my entire outlook on life. Like nothing else could have really. Um, so Claire Weeks, Claire Weeks's method and what she taught in her day. I mean, she wrote that book in 1962, and she was years ahead of her time in her approach. And as I said, back in those days, the approach was psychoanalysis, uh, psychoanalysis, go to a psychiatrist, they'd find out what subconscious reasons causing you to be afraid, et cetera, et cetera. Claire Weeks took a totally different approach. She said in her book, the majority of people have suffered from what was termed nervous breakdown then, or you know, just bad nerves. <clears throat> the majority of people that she has ever encountered and treated were simply afraid of the state that they were in. There was no deep seated reason, no subconscious cause, it was simply fear of the fear. And at the time, she was. You know, criticised by her contemporaries for coming out with such a simple answer, and it was simple, simple, straightforward, and logical. And it made, when I read it for the first time, it made perfect sense to me because this is exactly what had happened to me. But she was very brave and she was very persistent, and her books, that particular book, went on to sell countless copies because it's such a great book. And she continued for years afterwards to write books, and I've got them all. And she did; she actually did recordings so people could listen to. And she was on television, being you know I've got a video of her as well. But that, for you know, for anyone who wants to understand the anxiety state, I mean, it's a bit old-fashioned now in some respects that book, but the principles are still solid and sound. What she taught is the way. I mean. She used to describe it as a simple method, but not easy to carry out. I'll summarize it briefly. The first thing she said was, when you're, whatever your symptoms are, whatever you're feeling, the first step is to face the things you fear, face them. And she describes in the book how you start with anything, like for example, your churning, upset stomach. You examine it, you describe it to yourself, you actually, Instead of trying not to think about it like most people do, you actually describe it out loud to yourself. And this makes you face it. And then you realise that you're just... Then she went on to explain that, you know, this is just an expression of your sensitised nerves. And that if you stop fighting it and trying to get rid of it, it will just go away by itself. This was the next step, acceptance. And this is what I discovered when I, you know, that dark night I had. By resigning yourself to these feelings and accepting that they're there and they're going to be there for some time, not, not a long time, but for some time, the more you can learn to accept them, the sooner your nervous system can calm down and you'll be, 
you know, you'll be back to your normal self again. And this leads on to the third step, which she used to call floating. Now, floating means to do the opposite of what you've been doing to all the feelings you get. It meant to go with the feelings, like with panic attacks. Go with the feelings. Not fight them, just let them come, let them go, and not put up any resistance to them. Because it's the tension of resistance that is actually making them persist and making them worse. So you float through them. You don't fight your way through them. You float through them. Loosen some of that tension that you've got. And the last step was letting time pass, which means you've got to expect that it's going to take... It took time for you to get into the state, so it's going to take time to come out of it. So you've got to be prepared to let the symptoms and the feelings be there for the time, for the time being. They won't be there forever. They'll just be there forever time. And the more you can do this, the more you can follow the four principles, the quicker you will recover. And it's simple, it's logical, it's straightforward. It's so easy to understand, but like I said, it's not easy to do because it goes against everything you feel you should do. You feel as though you should be fighting, you should feel as though you should be trying, trying to get out of this state. And, uh, it is the way, and it does work. It does work. So your first place to look is Books and Recordings by Dr. Claire Weeks. Now, <clears throat> there is also, um, how can I say, uh, somebody who followed on from her work, a man called David Johnson. He lives in New Zealand. He suffered from panic attacks and anxiety, and he got himself better using her method. And he set about setting up his own counselling centre in New Zealand and helping people. And this, you know, he followed her principles, and many people got better because of his help. And then he went on to do a series of recordings, which he explains the method, as I call it. And he also added a great deal of his own insights and his own experience to these recordings, a fantastic set of recordings. And there's a, it's called the Freedom From Fear Recovery Program. You should be able to find it easily on the internet. There's a great forum, set of forums associated with this. If you get the, the series of recordings, you join the forum. And I, I still go to this forum because it's a fantastic, fantastic place. And there's lots of people there who have recovered who come back and help the ones that are still trying to recover. But anyway, he's an amazing man, and his ideas, like I say, he extended Dr. Dr. Weeks' ideas as well. David Johnson, New Zealand, that was his name. A third name I'd like to give you is a man called Geoffrey Hames, and he wrote a, he's written a fantastic book quite recently called The Panic Switch. Now, again, he was somebody who had suffered from panic. He'd had panic attacks for 15 years. And he found his own... He followed the work of Claire Weeks a lot, but he found a specific way to stop panic attacks completely. And it's quite a story. He describes it in his book. But his approach to... Sort of stopping panic is um, quite unique, really, because again, it's not a simple thing to do. He explains well, it's better if you read his book because he explains it better. But I can verify that what he says does work because I've done it myself. I've actually done it myself. So, those are the three sources you really need to check out because. There are so many different views on how to treat anxiety, so many possible possible ways that people say you can recover from. A lot of them are nowadays, thankfully, based on the original ideas of Claire Weeks. Uh, but the thing you need to remember is I know how desperate you can feel to want this thing gone out of your life for good. 
I know that feeling so well, and I know how, how miserable and wretched and horrible it makes you feel. I've been there. But if you want to be permanently cured of it, and you can be, the way ahead is through the ideas and teachings of Claire Weeks and the people that followed on from her, David Johnson, Jeffrey Holmes. Um, it's not an easy path to take and a lot of people get put off because of what's involved in it, but it is permanent. If you do it the right way, it's permanent. And this leads me into what I'll talk about on the next recording, which is after my uh, yeah, my panic and my anxiety in my teens, it was um, many years later, after a lot of things had happened in my life, that I again started to suffer from panic. And through those years, intervening years, I was kind of living in a fool's paradise because I thought I was cured of it. I thought I was never going to have panic and anxiety again. And I, I realized eventually why it was the panic had come, come back into my life and I realised that I hadn't actually been cured properly the first time around. If I had been, panic definitely would not have come back into my life. Anyway, I'm going to talk about that on the next recording, but meantime, please do check those names out that I've mentioned because they will help. What they've written and what they've said will help you very much you'll actually be hearing from somebody who understands the way you feel now. And that's what it's all about, is having somebody understand you and can tell you what to do in simple steps. That means everything. So thank you very much for watching and for listening, and uh, I'll talk to you next time.